celebrated contest for the leadership of Ohanese Ndiv. I was elected as President General of Ohanese, along with 16 other members of the National Executive Committee to lead our organization for the next four years. Our mandate was profound and humbling. We are grateful to Ndivo for the enormous trust and confidence which they have reposed in us. Nigerians of all ethnic nationalities have joined us to celebrate the outcome of this election. They have congratulated us for holding a peaceful election and for voting in an improved quality of representation from all Igbo speaking areas. Let me therefore congratulate the last National Executive Committee of Ohanese, led by Chief Gary Igariwe, for putting together this successful exercise. In particular, I'd like to place on record our gratitude to the Electoral Committee, <coughs> led by Professor Anya Oanya and Professor ABC Mosu for a transparent and credible election. Equally commendable is the complete unanimity of all the governors in all Igbo speaking areas in supporting the just concluded elections <coughs> and ensuring effective representation of their various states at the General Assembly. I acknowledge with thanks and the messages of congratulations we received from other socio-cultural organizations and prominent Nigerians, including but not limited to our Fenifer, Arewa Consultative Forum, PANDEF, Chief Edwin Clark, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, Alaji Atiku Abubakar, Governor Lee Ali Moke, His Eminence John Cardinal Amaikon, Archbishop Matthew Kuka, and Governor Obon Victor Atta. Of notable mention, is the unanimous solidarity of the Southeast Caucus of the National Assembly, led by Deputy Senate President, Distinguished Senator Ike Ekwere We thank them most sincerely. More importantly, I cannot fail to acknowledge the timely and cheering congratulations of His Excellency the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, <coughs> President Mohammed Buhari. Mr. President, in his message of congratulations, expressed his readiness to work with the new Ohanese leadership. We salute the President for his kind hand of fellowship. At a time when we will have great concern about their participation and treatment in the Nigerian states. This hand of fellowship offered by Mr. President, I believe, will enable us to engage him meaningfully and find an early resolution to our extant misgivings. Ndibo in today's Nigeria face many problems. Under the current federal government, Igbo representation is abysmal and falls extremely short of the constitutional provisions for the reflection of federal character in the appointment into important government positions. No arm of government, namely the executive, judiciary, or legislature, is headed by an Igbo. No section of the armed forces or paramilitary organization is headed by an Igbo. Neither the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, nor the Federal High Court is headed by an Igbo. We know in the history of this country, when a Lieutenant Colonel was appointed to the position of Chief of General Staff, over and above his superiors, just to ensure ethnic balance. We know when a Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation was appointed Chief Justice of Nigeria just to ensure ethnic balance. We know when a former military head of state was drafted to run for president just to douse ethnic tensions. What is very perturbing is the public declaration of Mr. President that his appointments must favor the states that voted overwhelmingly for him and those he trusts, even against the provisions of our constitution relating to federal character. One is at sea why Ndibu, who campaigned and voted for Mr. President, appear not to be trusted. No wonder he defied his own structure of his party and appointed a, a non-Igbo man as Secretary to Government of the Federation. No wonder the ministries with lean capital votes are the ones assigned to Ndibu. No wonder 
He nominated ambassadors for confirmation to the National Assembly, naming three ambassadors for some states, and only one ambassador for each of the states. No wonder one year and eight months into his tenure as president, he has not visited any Igbo states. Why we be born this patently discriminatory treatment of Igbo in appointment into political positions? Addressing of capital projects is perhaps more pathetic. No railway construction is going on in the Dolat. The Enugu Port Harcourt and Enugu Anita Expressways have become national embarrassments. State governors in Igbo states now rehabilitate federal roads in Igbo land from their lean budgets so as to keep alive mobility of factors of production in our region. Whereas 70% of power generated in China is from coal and 40% of America's power is from coal, the coal in Enugu, which is a federal resource, continues to lie unexploited. The boy in states continues to bring up the rear in federally collected resources in spite of its mineral endowments of salt and lead. To make matters worse, on Tuesday, the 25th of October 2016, the president presented a $29.9 billion three-year extended now borrowing plan to the National Assembly, which will potentially raise our total external debt to $41 billion in three years and raise our debt to GDP ratio from 13.2% to 20.7% without considering it fit to allocate a single project in this external borrowing plan to the Southeast. The economic strangulation of Ndibo has, over time, been perpetuated by the confining of mainland Ndibo to five states. Every other geopolitical zone in Nigeria has six to and seven states respectively. Of the 774 local governments in the Federation, just three northern states have more local governments than the whole of the Southeast put together. Under this lopsided structure of the Nigerian state, the common wealth of the country continues to be distributed using states and local governments as parameters, whilst any talk about restructuring of the Federation is clearly not on the present agenda. The peaceful coexistence previously existing between peace-loving Fulani herdsmen who headed their cattle with long kings and our local farmers has been replaced by an era of AK-47 and rampaging herdsmen who kill, maim, rape our people and destroy our farms. Not one of them is ever arrested for illegal possession of firearms. Even those arrested in Nimbo for mercilessly killing our people remain unprosecuted by the northern-dominated law enforcement agents. A picture of the Orwellian animal farm, where all farmers, all animals are equal, but some, how, some animals are more equal than others, is painted. In Lagos State, after the threat of throwing our people into the lagoon during the last elections, it has become habitual for the Lagos State government hiding under the pretext of urban renewal and development to wantonly demolish shops and business premises of Ndibu all around Lagos. This happens notwithstanding the fact that a sizable percentage of the economy of Lagos State was built on free will investment of Ndibu. I must at this juncture salute two eminent traditional rulers in Northern Nigeria who have spoken up for Ndibu. His eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, whilst calling for the release of Unna and the Kappa last year, praised the contributions of Ndibo in Sokoto and described them as law abiding. His Highness, the Emir of Kano, in a celebrated speech, spoke of the unwritten agreement between the North and the West to keep Ndibo down as a result of the first coup and the war, and warned that this agreement must be reviewed as the Indigo who are now being punished are likely those who did not participate in the war. This brings me to the rise of MASOP and IPOP. Both organizations, no matter how divided they appear in public, are basically motivated by the same sense of outrage and bitterness. Our young men and women can no longer tolerate a second-hand status in their own country. They can no longer forgive the president for arguing before he came into office 
that Niger Delta militants were meekly treated and tolerated by President Yaradua, while Boko Haram was harshly treated by President Jonathan. When his own law enforcement agents literally opened fire and maimed and kill unarmed Masop and IPOP members. They see how returning Boko Haram members are absorbed and rehabilitated, while leaders of Mapop and IPOP are incarcerated and mercilessly murdered. In their rage, they are becoming uncontrollable as they pass a vote of no confidence on us, their parents, describing us as cowards and compromised. Because the, old, because the older and the people have seen the war, the last civil war, and its devastating consequences, they naturally hesitate to support any military action against the Nigerian state that might waste their children. Because Ndibo business class is heavily invested in Nigeria outside Igbo land, they fervently believe in a united Nigeria, even if it marginalized politically. Consequently, a polarization of Ndibo between proponents of Biafra and proponents of restructuring of Nigeria exists. Both sides agonize in futility, giving the lukewarmness of the Nigerian leadership to either of their wishes. This is a ticking time bomb. As President General of Organizing, I intend to extend my warm hand of paternity to IPOP and Masop. They are my children. I shall never desert them. Their struggle is my struggle even if we do not completely agree with their methods. In warfare, there are two types of approach, coercion and diplomacy. I completely favor diplomacy. The hand of fellowship which Mr. President has extended to our leadership gives me immense confidence that we can tame rising tempers. No one is listening to the other. Somehow we believe that our present situation can only be explained by marginalization and hatred. My people, the time for lamentation is over. Our continued cry of marginalization has become still. No one is listening to us anymore. I take up the challenge of this onerous assignment, <coughs> confident in the facts that I know the indie world that have to be said. I am aware that in the DNA of the average Igbo person are bold strands of ingenuity, resourcefulness, intelligence, and the ability to survive and thrive in the face of various odds and challenges. This is our gift from Almighty God, which has served us well again and again. The Igbo constitute the arteries and the veins upon which the Nigerian economy thrives. The head of the political division of the American Embassy once said that the Igbo constitutes the largest block of highly educated black population in the United States and that they are all in significant professional occupations. He stated that even people in America say 40% of their earnings, it will be more than half of the total annual oil revenue of Nigeria. As an economist, I know that at this point in our quest for development, it is paramount to change the Ugo side from our propensity for heavy investment, primarily in real estate, to setting up industries and factories with the potentials for wealth creation. Such production units will offer jobs and incomes to our youth and grow the Igbo economy. The factories, I must point out, should of course be cited in Igbo land and not elsewhere. I think there's a type of graphical error. Uh, something has been omitted in that last page. And, uh, I group that science as we have done it before. We built a factory in Nigeria, Niger Sem in Kalago. The second brewery in Nigeria, the Golden Guinness Brewery in Omoai. The first building material industry in Nigeria, Tonas Asbestos and Iron and Steel Parts in MNN. The Potter Cut Michelin Tires and Legalism. The first indigenous university in Nigeria, the University of Nigeria. During this time, the World Bank recognized Southeastern Nigeria as the fastest growing economy in Africa. We can do it again.
As you go away from this inaugural meeting of Ohane's National Executive Committee, I want to be able to go with the confidence that you have inaugurated the beginning of a new era for Ohane's. A new era of transparency and accountability. An era for the repatriation of Igbo capital for the building of a new economic infrastructure for us. An era of sustained and active fight for the restructuring of our federation. An era of a strong and all evolving Ohanese. On my part as President General, I promise that I shall stand up for you. I will fight for you. I am ready to sacrifice for you. And if necessary, die. I pray for your support. I ask for your prayers. May the Almighty God help us. Thank you for your kind attention.